This is the book with no pictures by B.J. Novak. This is a book with no pictures. It might seem like no fun to have someone read you a book with no pictures. It probably seems boring and serious, except here is how books work. Everything the, <clears throat> everything the words say, the person reading the book has to say, no matter what. That's the deal, that's the rule. So that means even if the words say, blork, wait, what? Well, that doesn't even mean anything. Blurf, wait a second, what? This isn't the kind of book I wanted to read. And I have to say every word that the book says. Uh-oh. I am a monkey who taught myself to read. Hey, I'm not a monkey. And now I'm reading you this book with my monkey mouth in my monkey voice. Well, it's not true. I'm not a monkey. Yes, I am a monkey. Also, I'm a robot monkey. What? And my head is made of blueberry pizza. Wait a second. Is this whole book a trick? Can I stop reading, please? No. And now it's time for me to sing you my favorite song. A song. Do I really have to sing it? Glug, glug, glug. My face is a bug. I eat ants for breakfast right off the rug. What? This book is ridiculous. Can I stop reading yet? No, there are more pages. I have to read the rest. My only friend in the whole wide world is a hippo named Boo Boo Butt. Boo Boo Butt? And also, the kid I'm reading this book to is the best kid ever in the history of the entire world. Oh, really? And this kid is the smartest kid, too, because this kid chose this book, even though it had no pictures. Because kids know this is the book that makes grown-ups have to say silly things and make silly sounds, like, oh, no. Oh, no, here it comes. Glurgawako, my grumpadoo. ay 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 boo 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 Oof, eef, blaggity, blaggity, blippity, bloppity, glippity, beep, boop, eee, badongy face. Oh my goodness. Please don't ever make me read this book again. It is so silly. In fact, it is completely and utterly preposterous. Next time, please, please, please choose a book with pictures, please, because this is just too ridiculous to read. The end. Bonk. I didn't want to say that. Today I'm going to read A Frog Thing by Eric Drachman. Frank wanted to fly, but he was a frog, and frogs can't fly. Frank was different, though. Special, aerodynamic. You can do whatever you set your mind to, Frankie, his parents had prom promised. So Frank set his mind to flying but it was more like falling than flying, and everyone laughed at him. Tired and discouraged, Frank buried his head in the big webbed feet, and that's how Frank's parents found him. Frank explained his problem, and there was a long silence 
as they thought about how to respond. Frankie started Frank's dad, finally. When we said you could do anything you set your mind to, we meant any frog thing. See, flying is a bird thing. Just like staying underwater forever is a fish thing. Yes, you should find a frog thing, said Mom, but I want to fly. I'm sorry, kiddo, but frogs can't fly, explained Dad. No, agreed Mom. We swim and we hop, but we don't fly. They don't understand, he thought. We understand, they said, and patted Frankie's shoulder. Frank sat in the dark, still sad, but growing more determined. I'll show them, he thought. I'll learn to fly, and I'll fly right over the pond. He jumped and ran and leapt and dove. He flapped and flapped and flapped and finally just flopped on top of a leaf to rest. He soaked his sore feet and hung his heavy head until Flash! Something crashed into the water and started to sink. Frank leapt into an action. It's a little baby bird, he thought. He swooped down. He swept her up and swam her back to shore. The nervous mother bird hugged her baby tight. Her baby coughed, then wheezed, then opened her eyes, safe and warm in her mother's wing. The mother bird turned and kissed Frank right on him the cheek. He was very surprised and a little embarrassed. Thank you, thank you, she chirped. What a great swimmer you are. How can I ever repay you? Oh, it was nothing, ma'am, said Frank, for he was a very polite and modest frog. Please, I want to do something for you, anything. Well, suggested Frank, I really, really want to fly and you are and you still want to fly frank shrugged i've set my mind to it but frogs don't fly said the mother bird i know admitted frank she looked in his eyes then flew off in a flutter wait here, she cried, I'll be right back. And she did come back with another bird and a twig between them. Grab on, she called. Before he knew it, they were high above the trees. The morning sun streamed through the sky and the wind whistled over Frank slick green skin. It was a little scary at first, but soon he relaxed as they glided and rose and swooped and dove. Everyone hurried to see Frank fly. They wanted, they watched from the bank as he and the birds passed high overhead. This is no ordinary frog thing, observed Frank's mom. 
When their flight was finished, the mother bird pulled Frank close. You are a very special frog, she said, and with a whoosh of her wings, flew back to her nest. Breathless, Frank waved, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Frank hopped home, somehow lighter than before. On, this, on his way home, he met his folks. Frankie, we saw you up there, Mom beamed. Fantastic, croaked Dad. You can do anything you set your mind to. Anything, agreed Mom. Well, any frog thing, maybe, Frank explained. The birds were the ones flying. I was just holding on. But I do think I could be one of the great swimmers. His parents smiled proudly as Frank joined his friends in the pond. Frank had wanted to fly, but he was a frog, and frogs can't fly, but they can sure swim. I'm going to read If You Were a Penguin. The authors are Wendell and Florence Minor. If you were a penguin, what could you do? You could fly underwater. Or sing a duet. You could live on the land, but get really wet. You could wear a tuxedo or make funny faces. You could go for a swim in warm or cold places. You could live underground or on top of the ice. Penguin pals all around make it twice as nice. You could have funny names like Chinstrap and Gentoo you could learn to toboggan. Woohoo! You could wear fancy feathers in dry or wet weather. You could eat squids and fishes without any dishes. But here's a, here's a surprise for me and for you. Penguins do lots of things. and you can do too, that you can do too. I'm going to read Poodleina by E.B. McHenry. In a big city, high rise, on the very top floor, lived a pink fluffy poodle, Poodleina Pompadour. She wore on her head a pink mountain of hair, as light as a feather, and mostly pink air. Can we see it? Okay. Days were spent teasing her fabulous fluff. Shaving legs, painting toenails, and other such stuff. It took lots of work and a good bit of spray to look pretty and perfect in just the right way. She'd fuss and she'd tweeze, she'd paint and she'd fluff, she'd powder, perfume, and pink herself up. When finally finished, leashed late in the day, she'd leave for the park for the dog time to play. Down, down she'd go at three quarters, just four, 
to the elegant lobby from the very top floor. From the cheapest, or from the, from the elegant lobby and revolving glass doors through rush hour traffic, just big city stores. Can you see her down there? At five, she'd arrived to a wild dog park scene where dogs whizzed around, fetching falls on the green. But she kept far away from the ball fetching jaws, away from the wet noses and mud padded paws. Safe on the sidewalk, all fluffed pink and clean, never running or sniffing, wanting just to be seen. One night storm clouds blew in, heavy rains filled the sky. No dog park for days. She stayed in, clean and dry. She fussed and she tweezed. She painted and fluffed. She powdered, perfumed, and pinked herself up. When the rain finally stopped, she returned to the scene and arrived extra pink, extra fluffed up and clean. The disaster had struck, the park was afloat. Mud covered the sidewalk, it looked like a moat. The mud was a river, an ocean, a sea. She felt kind of itchy. Did she feel a flea? She did feel a flea. In fact, she felt three. Stopping to scratch, she was hit suddenly. She flew up in the air, spinning round and around, getting covered in mud as she slid to the ground. Her mountain of hair hung soggy and small, her pink perfect look somehow lost in the fall. Woozy but wagging, shaken up but not down, she was chased by a chow, so she chased him around. She raced after balls, fetching more than a few, staying late, playing games, till all vanished from view. With so many balls to be fetched in a day, now she fluffs a bit less and makes more time to play. One powder with pink and then off to the park. To chase balls on the green and get dirty till dark. This is a book called Hey Grandoon and it's by Paul McCartney. You guys will not remember a band called the Beatles, but I bet your parents will. And this was one of the main guys in the Beatles. And he's written a book for children. And it starts with a postcard. Dear reader, my name is Edward Marshall Sr. I have four grandchildren. I call them chillers, and they call me grand dude. I live in a very normal house on a very normal street. But when my chillers come to stay, we go on adventures that are far from normal. Sometimes things get a little bit out of hand, but everything always works out fine in the end. Come and join us on an adventure. Yours sincerely, Grand Dude. Lucy and Tom and M and Bob were spending a weekend with their granddad. Today was one of those days when nothing felt quite right. It was gray and drizzly, and everybody was grumpy and too bored to be bothered. Cheer up, chillers, said Grand Dude, and he pulled out a pile of postcards 
from the back pocket of his trousers. Look at these. M picked out a postcard of a sandy beach and sparkling blue waters. I wish we could go there, Grand Dude, she said. Well, let's see what we can do. Grand Dude reached into his coat pocket and took out a shiny compass. He gave the compass a rub and waved it over the postcard. The needle started to spin round and round. See the compass needle spin, let the magic fun begin. And then, in a flash of magic, zing, bang, sizzle, everything changed. The children were standing on a golden beach with little waves tickling their toes. The water felt beautifully cool. We're on the beach from the postcard, Bob laughed as he splashed in the sea. But the magic compass hadn't finished yet. Huge flying fish leaped from the sea. Hey, Grand Dude, they called. It's a school of flying fish, said Grand Dude. Come on, chillers, let's go for a ride. A school, whispered Lucy. I hope we don't have to do any homework. They skimmed across shimmering blue waves on the backs of the flying fish before coming to rest again on the hot sand. They built sandcastles and then lay beneath a coconut tree eating ice cream. The memory of their gray, grumpy day was completely washed away, and they were perfectly happy until... Ouch! cried Bob. A little crab scuttled across the beach. That crab pinched my toe. Oh, no. Suddenly, lots of little crabs were scurrying out of the sea, heading straight toward Grand Dude and the children. Hey, Grand Dude, said Em. Can we go somewhere a little less pinchy? Yes, I think we'd better hop to it, said Grand Dude. He quickly waved the magic compass over another postcard. This one had a picture of a cowboy. See the compass needle spin. Let the magic fun begin. The magic flashed and sparkled, and once again, zing, bang, sizzle. Everything changed. Grand Dude and the children found themselves in a desert valley with spiky green cactuses. A cowboy galloped toward them on a beautiful spotted horse. Hey, Grand Dude, called the cowboy, waving his hat in the air. Wow, what a handsome Appaloosa, said Grand Dude, admiring the horse. Appaloosa? asked him. No, that's the kind of horse it is. It has nothing to do with me, said Lucy. Grand Dude gave a whistle and five more horses came galloping up. He helped each of the children onto a horse and they raced together through the valley. Whee! cried Bob. Faster, yelled Lucy. But what was that cloud of dust on the horizon? Oh, no! A herd of wild buffalo was rushing straight toward them. The canyon echoed with the sound of a hundred hoofs. Before they could ride to safety, Tom's horse reared and he tumbled to the ground. Hold on, Tom, shouted Grand Dude, snatching a rope from the cowboy's saddle. With a twirl, he lassoed Tom and hauled him onto his horse. Ride, chillers, cried Grand Dude, as fast as you can. They cleared the stampede just in time. Hey, Grand Dude, panted Tom. Perhaps we could go somewhere a little less stampy. Yes, good idea, said Grand Dude, and I think I need to cool down. Once again, he whipped out his magic compass and waved it over a postcard. See the compass needle spin, let the magic fun begin. Before the children could see the picture, magic sparkled and flashed, and in the blink of an eye, zing, bang, sizzle, everything changed. They found themselves high on a hill in the afternoon sun. The children laughed as they rolled in sweet-smelling wildflowers that seemed to stretch forever. Grand Dude pulled out his trusty guitar and been strumming, began strumming a song. Hey, Grand Dude, mooed some friendly cows, their bells tinkling along to the tune. Grand Dude drew a small telescope from his pocket, and they took turns looking at the snow-capped peaks. But soon they heard a rumbling sound. Oh, no! Hey, Grand Dude, look, yelled Lucy as she peered through the telescope. A huge wall of snow was sliding down from the mountains above. Avalanche! Quick, chillers, cried Grand Dude. Jump! 
Just before the wave of snow reached them, Grandude and the children leaped onto one of the cows. Up, cow, up, Grandude cried. Magic swirled from the compass, lifting them all higher and higher off the ground, sailing them safely through the sky with the sea of snow rushing beneath them. Swiss cows are exceptionally good flyers, said Grandude. Now, riding a flying cow is a lot of fun, but it had been a very long day. Hey, Grandude, said Lucy with a yawn. Maybe we could go somewhere a little more sleepy, said Grandude with a chuckle. That sounds like a very good idea. This time, instead of a postcard, Grandude pulled a photograph of his own house from his pocket. Magic compass, one more spin, it's time for bedtime to begin. He waved his compass over it, making the magic sparkle and spin, and just like that, zing, bang, sizzle, they were back in Grand Dude's living room. And the compass hadn't finished yet. With a final flash of magic, the children were changed and ready for bed. Their teeth were brushed, their faces were washed, and they were all tucked up tight. And in five minutes flat, Tom and Bob and Lucy and Em were fast asleep dreaming of their next adventure. See the compass needle spin, let the magic fun begin. Good night, Grand Dude. I'm gonna read Silly Sally by Audrey Wood. Silly Sally went to town, walking backwards, upside down. Girl. On the way, she met a pig, a silly pig. They danced a jig. Silly Sally went to town, dancing backwards, upside down. On the way, she met a dog, a silly dog. They played leapfrog. Silly Sally went to town, leaping backwards, upside down. On the way, she met a loon, a silly loon. They sang a tune. Silly Sally went to town, singing backward, upside down. On the way, she met a sheep, a silly sheep. They fell asleep. Now, how did Sally get to town sleeping backwards upside down? Along came Nettie Buttercup, walking forwards right side up. He tickled the pig who danced a jig. He tickled the dog who played leapfrog. He tickled the loon who sang a tune. He tickled the sheep who fell asleep. He tickled Sally who woke right up. She tickled Nettie Buttercup. And that's how Sally got to town walking backwards upside down. Okay, Will and I are gonna read Otis and the Puppy by Lauren Long. It was springtime on the farm where the friendly little tractor named Otis lived. The flowers bloomed, the trees are filled with leaves, and the farm buzzed with the joy of a new season. There were fields to plow and crops to plant. Otis was right in the middle of it, working hard. Put, puff, puttity, chuff. When the workday was over, Otis, the little calf, and all their farm friends loved to play hide and seek. Otis loved to be it, counting one putt, two puff, three puttity, four chuff, as his friends ran to hide. When he reached in, it was game on, and Otis motored here and there looking for his friends. He found the little calf hiding in a deep thicket of wildflowers. He found the ducks hiding in mud pond, and he found the bull hiding in the haystack. Those the animals would play until the sun disappeared behind the trees, making sure to be home before darkness fell. 
One evening, the farmer gathered everyone up in front of the barn and gently placed a burlap sack on the ground. The sack began to wobble, tumble, and roll. It sat up, stretched to the sky, and went, arr, arr, arr. What could be in there? Then out popped a little head. A puppy. The puppy shook his ears, raised his head to the sky, and yelped out another, arr, arr, arr. Then he barked, burst out the sack and romped around, getting greeting everyone with wet kisses. He wriggled from head to toe, and his spotted tail wiggled and wagged, wagged and wiggled. The farm animals smiled as they watched their happy new friend. And then as quickly as he jumped out of the sack, he wobbled over to Otis, leaned on his tire, yawned, slouched, and popped up to sleep. The farmer put an old dog house in front of the barn, scooped up the sleepy puppy, placed him in his new home, and said, Good night, little pup. Otis, the little calf, and all the animals followed to the barn for a good night's sleep. Otis yawned and nestled into his stall. He was thrilled to have the little puppy on the farm, and he smiled as he drifted off to sleep. Put, puff, put it zzzz. All of a sudden, he woke to a pitiful whimper. The whimper turned into a whine, and a whine into a yelp. It was the puppy. It was dark as midnight. Otis took a deep breath, clicked on the headlights, and put it out to the doghouse, where he found the puppy trembling with fear. He was afraid of the dark. With a chuff, Otis invited him into the barn, where the puppy curled up and fell fast asleep. From that night on, the puppy would slink from his doghouse into the barn with Otis, where he felt safe. And after a day of working on the farm, the two friends would play hide and seek with the others. One day, while it was Otis's turn to be it, he sat counting to ten while the others hid. One putt, two puff, three puttity, four chuff. But the puppy had something else on his mind. Otis finished counting, peeled out, and muttered here and there, puff, putt, puff, puttity, chuff, swerving and darting and skidding as fast as he could to find his friends. He found a little calf hiding behind the old apple tree, and the ducks hiding in a scraggly growth of honeysuckle. And he found the massive bull trying his best to hide behind a long dandelion. But where was the puppy? Otis and the animals searched high and low. Even the farmer came to help, but they couldn't find the puppy anywhere. Finally, the farmer stopped the search. It's getting dark, he said. Let's continue the search in the morning light. By the time they reached the barn, it was already quite late, and all the animals went right to bed. Yet Otis couldn't sleep. His heart ached deep inside his engine. He knew how scared of the dark his new friend was, and he was worried that the puppy had wandered into the forest. He pinned over to the barn door, looked out into the night, and sighed. Like a little puppy, Otis, too, was afraid of the dark, but he knew what he had to do. He clicked on his headlights and puffed out into the night. Just inside the forest, Otis stopped dead in his tracks. The sounds of the night crackled, thumped, and croaked all around him. His heart pounded and he shook like a leaf. Every part of him wanted to turn and run back to the farm, yet he knew his friend needed him. So he closed his eyes and began to count. One putt, two puff, three putty, four chuff. By the time he got to five, Otis felt a lot calmer. When he hit ten, it was game on. He peeled out and muttered here and there. He swerved and darted and skidded and flashed his headlights everywhere in the dark night. He circled and crisscrossed the forest, making sure to see every possible place a puppy could hide. Finally, his light shone across an old hollow log with a little spotted tail poking out of one end. The puppy was whimpering softly, too scared to come out. But when he heard Otis, he squealed with joy. Arf, arf, arf! He wriggled and wagged and wiggled right out of that log. He squealed and cried and covered Otis's face with kisses. Then the two friends began to make their way home. They stood tall together as they passed through the dark forest, and somehow the night sounds no longer felt so frightening to them. On the farm, a warm, safe bed waited them. Before long, a new day would arrive full of bright sunshine, work, and play. The end.